platonic solids, you've probably heard of those before. You know, the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. And you've probably seen the formulae for each of their volumes. But have you ever wondered how we got those numbers? Do they follow some kind of hidden pattern? What if there was a general formula where we can insert the values describing a platonic solid and calculate its volume? And why does it matter when there's only five of them? Before we look at the polyhedra, we should be acquainted with a particular concept in geometry, the Schlafly symbol. The Schlafly symbol is used to describe regular geometric objects. For instance, an equilateral triangle would have a Schlafly symbol of 3 because it has 3 sides. A square would have a Schlafly symbol of 4, a pentagon 5, and so on. A Schlafly symbol of 2 or 1 does exist, but they don't make sense without curves. So for now, we'll only be dealing with Schlafly symbols where the numbers are 3 or above. For a regular polyhedron, the Schlafly symbol contains two numbers. The first number describes the shape of each face. For instance, a cube is made of squares, so its first number would be 4. The second number is usually described as the number of faces coming together in a vertex, but that's not exactly true. Instead, it's more like the shape of a vertex. What does that mean? Imagine a cube and take a vertex, any vertex. Now take the vertices next to it and connect them together to form a new polygon. That's the shape of a vertex, and in this case it's a triangle. So the second number of the Schlafly symbol of a cube is 3. Take another regular polyhedron, the dodecahedron. It has pentagons as faces, and the adjacent vertices of a particular vertex form a triangle, so its Schlafly symbol is 5-3. And here are the Schlafly symbols of the platonic solids. This will be important to deriving the general formula later. We also need to know the general formula for regular polygons. Here it is. So how do we figure this out? Well, as it turns out, we can divide the regular polygon into identical isosceles triangles by connecting each vertex to the center of the polygon. The angle connected to the center is 360 degrees divided by the number of sides. And then we can use trigonometry to figure out the height of the triangle, then subsequently the area of the triangle and the polygon. So now it's time to talk about the polyhedra. Just like how we can divide a polygon into triangles, we can divide a polyhedron into pyramids by connecting the vertices to the center. With the general formula for regular polygons, we can find the area of the base pretty quickly. But what about the height? Well, it can be found by finding the angle between the base and one of the sides, then using trigonometry to solve for it. So how do we find this angle? Let's take a look at the dodecahedron. We take a base and connect its vertices to its center. We need the angle between the base and one of the sides in order to find out its height. So let's try finding it. We take this edge and connect perpendicular lines to it from the two faces sharing it. Then we take this vertex and connect its adjacent vertices to create this polygon. Now we have a new pyramid with two line segments on its faces. How long is this segment? Well, it doesn't matter, and you'll see why in a second. Anyway, let's rename this segment as B and this one as C. Then we extend a line and connect these two points to form line segment D. You may have already realized this triangle right here is a right triangle. So B over C equals the sine of this angle. Now since the face is part of a regular pentagon, this angle would equal 108 degrees, and this angle would be the same as this other angle. So we subtract 108 from 180 and divide it by 2 to get 36 degrees. So B over C equals sine 36 degrees. Now onto the base of this pyramid. It should be pretty easy to see that it is an equilateral triangle. So now we extend a perpendicular line from D to this angle, and we get a new equation. D over 2C equals sine 30 degrees. Now take a look at this triangle. If we extend a perpendicular line from the base to this point, we can find a right triangle. In particular, this angle right here, we'll call it phi, is exactly what we've been looking for. So sine phi equals D over 2B. And we can find phi by dividing d over 2c by b over c, then take the arc sine of that value. So we have found the angle between the base and one of the sides of the pyramid. Now, with this line and phi, we can find the height. How do we find this line? By dividing the polygon into triangles. The line is the height of these triangles, or x over 2 tangent v. Multiply this value with tangent phi, and we get the height of a pyramid. Now we can multiply the base area with the height and divide it by 3 to get the volume of the pyramid. And since the dodecahedron has 12 faces, we multiply that by 12 and we get the volume of the dodecahedron. Let's try this method with an icosahedron. 
We take this vertex and connect these vertices to form a pentagon. Then we extend perpendicular lines from this edge. In this case, it connects to the vertices on the other side. Take this line as B, this line as C, and connect these two vertices to form D. The faces are equilateral triangles, so B over C equals sine 60 degrees. Connect a perpendicular line to this vertex to find D over 2C. Take this triangle and find D over 2B, or sine phi. Now back to this pyramid. I'll skip over the particular steps, but the length of this line can be found with trigonometry. Multiply that by tangent phi to get the height, then multiply that by the base area, divide by 3 and multiply by 20 to get the volume of the icosahedron. By this point, you can probably see a certain pattern emerging. We can make a pyramid with a vertex as the tip and a polygon connecting the adjacent vertices as the base. Then we extend perpendicular lines from the middle of one of the edges to the base. We can use the trigonometric relations between these lines to figure out the angle between two faces. Then we make a pyramid with a face of the polyhedron as the base and the center of the polyhedron as the tip. Divide the face into triangles to find the distance between an edge and a center, and multiply that with the tension of the angle we discovered to get the height. Finally, multiply the height with the area of the face, divide by 3, and multiply that with the number of faces to get the volume of the platonic solid. Here are some figures describing the angle phi for each platonic solid. As you can see, the value of B over C depends on the angles of the face of the polyhedron. Specifically, B over C equals the sine of 180 minus the angle at the top and divided by 2, like so, where P describes the shape of each face. We can simplify it to get sine V. Then there is the value of D over 2C, and they depend on the angles of the polygon connecting the adjacent vertices. Specifically, D over 2C equals the sine of half the angle of said polygon, like so, where Q describes the shape of each vertex. We can simplify it to get sine 90 degrees minus 180 degrees over Q, or cosine V1. Now we take the arc sine of cosine V1 over sine V to get the value of phi. So now we get a basic structure of the formula. For a platonic solid with f faces, side length x, and Schlafly symbol PQ, we get this formula. Simplify it and we get this. And then we can simplify tangent arc sine cosine V1 over sine V, since tangent arc sine k equals k over the square root of 1 minus k squared. So we'll get this. For our purposes, I'll write it as this. It'll be easier to check this way, especially when you're using the exact values of sine v and cosine v1. Similarly, I'll write this as this. And with that, we have the formula. p times f times x cubed divided by 24 multiplied by 1 minus sine v squared divided by sine v squared multiplied by the square root of cosine v1 squared divided by sine v squared minus cosine v1 squared. Except, I'm not satisfied just yet. There are way too many variables right now. Wouldn't it be nice if we can eliminate at least one of them? Well, you're in luck. Aside from the Schlafly symbol, a platonic solid can also be described by the number of vertices, edges, and faces it has. If you take the number of faces and multiply the number of edges each face has, you get twice the number of edges. That's because every face shares one edge with another. You get the same result multiplying the number of vertices with the number of edges connected to a vertex, since every edge connects two vertices. Additionally, in 1758, Leonhard Euler discovered an interesting characteristic these variables possess. If you add the number of vertices and faces together, and subtract the number of edges from that, you get the number 2. Now we can start eliminating. P times F equals Q times V, so we can see that F equals Q times V divided by P. Next, write V as 2 plus E minus F, then write E as PF over 2. Now F equals Q times 2 plus PF divided by 2 minus F. After a little bit of work, we get F equals 4Q divided by 2P plus 2Q minus PQ. So if we substitute this into our formula, we get P times Q times X cubed divided by 6 times 2P plus 2Q minus PQ multiplied by 1 minus sine v squared divided by sine v squared multiplied by the square root of cosine v1 squared divided by sine v squared minus cosine v1 squared. You can express q in terms of p and f instead, but the formula would look a lot messier, particularly for v1. And that's all we can eliminate because p, q, and x don't change values according to the value of another. Whew. 
Whew, such a complicated formula, isn't it? And we have to know what a Schläfli symbol is to use it. It's way easier to memorize the formulae of the platonic solid separately and be done with it. After all, there's only five of them, right? A while ago, Jan Miesli made this awesome video about the regular polyhedra. We have way more than five regular polyhedra. We have twice as many and then some. Can the same be said for the platonic solids? What if there was a forbidden method, if you will, to fold nets of one type of regular polygon together into some new shape that humanity has never discovered before? Well, let's find out with this formula. A certain part of this formula, to be exact. The reciprocal of the square root of sine v squared minus cosine v1 squared. Because it's a square root, the value within must be non-negative. And because it's in the square root of the denominator, it cannot be zero. Take a look at this graph. Now I'll show only the parts where the value takes a positive value, and where the numbers of the Schläfli symbol are at least 3. When q equals 3, the only naturals that satisfy this condition are 3 to 5. When q equals 4, only 3 satisfies the condition. Same goes for when q equals 5. When q is 6 or more, nothing satisfies the condition. And so we find that only 5 combinations of p and q fit the requirements. 3, 3, 3, 4, 3, 5, 4, 3, and 5, 3. It is algebraically indisputable that there are 5 and only 5 platonic solids. So, there you have it, the general formula for the volume of platonic solids. It may only work for 5 objects, but hey, maybe someone could modify it so it works for a regular star polyhedra as well. Or maybe it will help us if we ever try to find the general formula for the hypervolume of regular 4D objects. Or maybe there's a better formula somewhere, hidden deep in the well of knowledge. For now, I'll be sticking to this formula, and I hope you guys can find a use for it too.